So this is how not to suck at vulnerability management with Plug and Chris Halbersma. Uh, Plug is currently a paranoid fire member at OAuth. He started his journey in computer security back in 1996 when he discovered an A2600 magazine that eventually led him to the first LA2600 meeting in 1998. From that point forward, he has been involved in computer security. He has worked as systems administrator, security analyst, and security engineer in the finance and telecom sector. In his free time, he enjoys building Legos and playing with synthesizers and modular systems. When possible, he volunteers his time to computer security events. Chris is, a, is currently a senior security engineer at Verizon Digital Media Services, formerly Edgecast. He started working with computers in high school and having older, slower computers quickly made the move to Linux and BSDs to improve performance. From then on, he's worked with Nix Systems almost exclusively and a couple of years ago made the switch from being a systems administrator to working exclusively in security. When not working, Chris enjoys cryptocurrencies, his dogs, and putting wacky stuff on various Raspberry Pis. Please welcome Plug in Chris to the Showtime 2018. All right. So. Hey, guys. Yeah. Why don't you start it up? All right. So, morning. Thank you for being here. I know it's early. So, uh, welcome to Shellcon. Uh, so, I'm Plug, Chris. Um, and so today we're going to talk about bubble management, and primary we're going to talk about how not to suck bubble management. So uh, Chris and I um, work for a CDN, uh, it's Verizon Digital Media, in the past, and what we're going to tell you is our story working on that environment, which is pretty uh, fast-paced. Uh, we see seven to ten percent of the internet traffic around the world, so there's a lot of data, and it's very important that we manage vulnerabilities at a fast pace. So without further ado, let's talk about bubble management. And so why we did this talk? Well, let's talk about the current landscape. What you can see in this screen is a lot of different brands and companies, and they all have a few things in common. The first one is that they all have been breached. And the second one is that a lot of our data was part of the breach data that was exposed. And so that is really bad for us. It's really bad for them on PR. But also, if you look at the set of vulnerabilities, many of those vulnerabilities are tied into basically bad vulnerability management. Either you have databases that were exposed, you have vulnerabilities in software, maybe you have things that were on buckets that you forgot or credentials on GitHub and so forth. So, you know, this is part of your program and so this is the reason why we're doing this talk. We wanna hopefully help other people get better at bone management. Now, I like this actually, um, whoop, I think we just, something <laughs> just happened here. Yeah, we got hot spotted. We just got. It. All right, th they have our soul now. There it is. All right. Oh, we'll go back. All right. So I like that this is light. Uh, thank you for that little break. Um, so this is a very important thing because uh, Duo Labs actually put this report some time ago, and it, they actually discovered there's a lot of stuff on the cloud that is really bad, and they found a lot of the buckets open. So if you're using the cloud, you know, vulnerability management is important to you. So you know, we can tie in a lot of vulnerabilities, not only from the software side, but also on the cloud. So that's where we are, and this is the reason why we're doing this talk. Now, before we get further there, we need to define what vulnerability management is. And Vulnerability management is not a compliance check mark. If that's what you think it is, you're already doing it wrong, please don't do that, and hopefully this talk will help you have a different approach. So not a compliance check mark. Also, vulnerability management is, is not easy. You know, if it was easy, everyone will be able to do it. So there's challenges, and we want to talk about those. When you begin with a vulnerability management program, you're going to have to set some goals. These will define your program and it will help you mature that pr program. In our experience, these are the things that are important and things that you should consider. So the first one is quick identifications. How soon can you identify a vulnerability and you know, um, do something about it? So the sooner you know about a vulnerability, the better you're able to respond to that. So the goal is to reduce the time to discovery. Goal number two is triage. Now you know that there's a vulnerability then you have to make a decision. The blue teams do decisions and they have to do it fairly fast. As a vulnerability management team, you should be able to do that as well. So triage is super important. And finally, we wanna talk about remediation. So now that you know that there's a vulnerability and you figure out how important it is to you, you need to think about how you're gonna remediate or mitigate that vulnerability. So those should be your goals on your program, the things that you should target and try to mature and refine. 
Now, there are some challenges, and these are important. So first of all, there's a lot of sources of vulnerabilities. If you work in an environment where you have different operating systems, multiple network devices, and so forth, you get bulletins from different places. So it's difficult to navigate that landscape. Also, there are times where a vulnerability arrives and there is actually no patch. And sometimes you cannot even patch. Maybe you are working on outdated software, and so you need to account for these things. So this is an important one for me. A lot of people do vulnerable management. They really think about the um, CVSS system, which is the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Um, and my beef with this particular thing, it's a standard that is very useful, but if you're using only the score system to drive your vulnerabilities, you're already having problems because you need context to make decisions. You, you should not rely on that score system to decide whether something is critical, lower, or medium. You should add context. And I'm gonna give you some examples of why that matter. So does anyone know what these symbols mean? These, so the first one, yeah, okay. So the first one is Heartbleed, okay? Now, Heartbleed came out on 2014, and at the time they had the score system version 2.0. If you look at the score, it's a 5.0, yet most people treat it like really high. So the question is, if you were by the score system, what would you have done? What do you do? And so this is one example of a vulnerability that might have been important for some people and maybe not for others, but it was scored very low. Now, does anyone recognize the other label on the bottom? So that is Ethernal Blue, and so that was an exploit of vulnerability in SMB and allow you know, the uh, Mirai botnet, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the important thing about this one is that by now we have two scoring systems, 2.0 version and 3.0. So if you're going by the 3.0 version, which is the latest, it was a score at 8.1. If you use the two system, it was a score at 9.3. So then, which score system do you want to use? Version two or version three? And then if you use any of them, you might have downplayed the vulnerability. So again, context is very important. Finally, it's a score out of 10, yes. Um, so another thing that is important is that are sometimes undisclosed vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities that get out of CSV, right? But they don't have any score system. Like there's no score. Maybe there is even a patch out there, but you have no score. So what do you do? Again, this is why it's important that you try not to rely too much on the scoring system and you build something that allows you to take into consideration the context. How does this matter to my organization and what am I going to do about it? So. That's my beef with C, um, BSS score. And again, take it with a grain of salt. Now, when you do a vulnerability management program, you have to have some prerequisites. These are very important to help you get your program up started really um, in a good state, right? And so one of them is you need to know your assets, right? If you don't know your assets, then you don't know what you're gonna have to protect or patch or do something about. So uh, it's very important that if you have a spreadsheet and you have your IP addresses, host names, and everything else, it, that's fine. Ideally, move into a CMDB. There's a bunch of them open source. They're totally free. Um, you wanna make sure you keep your IP address space up to date and you, you know, that's a, a very important thing because you're gonna be scanning and doing other things. So a very important concept. If you have the cloud, there's a bunch of tools that are open source. Netflix is, is down, this, you know, down the hallway, and they actually have Security Monkey. You can use it totally free, and you can get a nice inventory of your assets on the cloud. Um, and then you need to consider, is, the, is this vulnerability at play? Is it at play for the cloud? Does it impact me? If so, which instances, and so forth. Another very important thing in vulnerability management is attribution. So now you have a vulnerability. You know that it impacts the system. But then who owns that system? Who is gonna patch the system? Am I responsible, someone else? How do I coordinate all of that? So being able to attribute a system, the ownership is super important. And it's super important because you need to do a triage and you need to decide who am I gonna contact to get this sorted out. So make sure that when you build your asset list, you also include who owns the asset, is there a team responsible, and so forth. Another thing that is extremely important in this attribution concept is that you never will be an expert on everything. So lean on your teams. Reach out to the team and say, hey, I don't know this. This seems to be yours. Is this yours? No. Does anyone know about this? It's okay. You work in security, but other teams know some things, um, systems better than you. And so it's okay to reach out. Do it. Now we're going to get a little bit into the theory, and then we're going back into some other topics. So. Great. Yeah. So we put together what we thought was a general theory of how to do vuln management. 
Um, so the, 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 the idea is that there's, a, there's intelligence from the outside, that's sort of external intelligence, and there's sort of your internal intelligence, how your environment looks. And you want to kind of merge those data sources together in a way that uh, makes sense. That way you can, you can action the data of it. Um, it uh, oftentimes you're going to find yourself saying things like, hey, go patch. Um, and sometimes you'll be asking other questions about like maybe like what libraries are used in your pieces of software. Um, but the most important rule of like doing vuln management well is not to get bogged down. Like you, if you're if you find yourself spending two three weeks on each vuln, uh, you're gonna you're gonna end up you know just you're gonna get a backlog of, of vulns that you're not being able to action because you're you're gonna get yourself bogged down too much. So ma so make sure that you can uh, you know be a little Muhammad Ali and like stick and move a bit. Um, so external intelligence, uh, it's a buzzword out there now, but uh, it, it can include a bunch of different things. So like uh, public CVEs, blog posts, security bulletins, other, other things. Um, you want to be picky about these sources. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a ton of them, but what you want to find is you want to find the ones that give you the most signal to noise ratio for your environment. So like if you're, if you're doing a bunch of stuff in the cloud and you, you're a big Java shop, maybe, maybe a, a vuln source from, uh, from Oracle that tells you about new Bones in Java is what you really want to focus on as your as your first choice. You know, uh, if you're like us and you you run a big Ubuntu shop, bunch of Ubuntu servers, you know, maybe Ubuntu security notices. If it's Red Hat, maybe it's Red Hat security notices. If it's Windows, maybe you're you're uh, you know Microsoft security bulletins. But whatever it is, you're gonna it's gonna require you to do a little bit of parsing of the data to really make sense of it and understand how it works. And like that can be human, but ideally you'd want to make that as machine parsed as possible. Um, so internal intelligence is kind of a buzzword we made up. Um, I hope to see it soon in every talk around the world. Um, but the, the important things that you want to do here is you want to you take information about your environment and you want to essentially, you don't have to cache it somewhere, but you should cache it somewhere for use. Um, and you really want to care about accuracy and, and quantity uh, of the data that you're gathering. Like you want, you want to gather most, if not all, of the, the data about your environment. You want to make sure that it's accurate. Because when, when you, when you send this data out elsewhere later on to, for people to do things, you want to make sure that you're not like, having to go back every time and you know, ask questions. You want people to trust your data effectively. And this is the point where it makes a lot of sense to build a lot of your integrations into your internal, external intelligence sources or into your asset management databases or just some of your control structures, whatever they happen to be. Um, so there are a bunch of tools that can provide you internal intelligence. Um, you can use like a bunch of network stuff. Um, there's a lot of network devices that you could look at. Like you could look at you know your switches and parse out like every active port. You know there, there's a bunch of different ways to grab this sort of data. Um, flow data is something that uh, we've we, we've started to look at, and it it actually provides very good intelligence about what what's sending stuff where. So you can figure out like what services are actually active on your servers. Um, we haven't done anything cool with flow data yet, but you know you should. That, that would be great, and then open source it so we can use it. Um, metrics are important when it comes to building your program. Uh, you want to collect your metrics to figure out what's going on, and uh, you want to be able to use the metrics you collect to, to improve the way that you do things. And you know, graphs are great. Uh, if you can graph out things, not only is it fun and makes me happy, it'll, it'll make, make you a better person, maybe. Um, uh, but it's it's very important to make sure that you don't make like convoluted graphs. Like this graph, it, it has a lot of great data in it, and if you look at it for a while, you can figure out what's going on. But don't don't send this to somebody and say, ah, yes, this, and then you know expect them to really understand what's going on. Like it's 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 not gonna do what necessarily what you want it to do. It's all right to make your graphs a little bit higher level. This is something that a, a former member of our team made about our, our network scan information that we got back. And it's actually very consumable. Like when we when we handed this to teams, they were able to really understand what we were what we were getting, not necessarily mad at, but you know, mad at. And you know, figure out like why what what sort of things we were saying, ah, oh, this is important. Um, so we're gonna talk about triage a little bit here. Cool. I'm gonna go back and I did this on the previous talk, but I really want to emphasize this graph portion. So take again a good look at that chart. It doesn't really make sense. It, it seems to make sense, but it's not. It, you really, how do you quantize that? You could do that better by just say iOS, really, and just summarize that, and maybe version 10 or nine, and that's the end of that. So this is a much better readable chart that you want your consumers to have. So do take some time to do better charts. They really make everyone's life easy. They explain the situation fairly good, and upper management actually likes them. So please do take care of your metrics and data. Let's talk about triage. So we remember, we talk about goals, right? The first goal was to be able to discover vulnerabilities and you know, understand that you know, whether we're 
you know, uh, there's something that we should take care of. But then now that you know there's a vulnerability, you want to triage. So let's talk about that. So in order for you to be able to triage, you need to know your software stack. So do you have Java? Yes, no. Do you have any other package? So the more you know your software stack, the better you get at triaging stuff. So, you know, CMDB, software related, merge them, you know, use that data. You need to know your environment, and sometimes you don't know your environment because it might be too large or too small, but also because there's other teams that know it better than you. Again, rely on your teams. Um, I'm gonna go back again to the CB because I gotta be with that. Don't rely on this core because it's not everything that you should care about. Context is important. So when you're doing triage, this core system should be useful, but not the main point of your triage. So another thing is you need to understand the vulnerability data. You need to validate the findings. So let's say that now you know there's a vulnerability and you decided to expose the vulnerability. You know, you want to test it. Does it work? Does it can I can it be exploited on my systems? You want to validate that because the last thing you want is to create work for teams and it turns out that you know it doesn't work. So very important to to do that. Um, triage. Um, you have to work with people. Again, very important, we're, we're hammering on the idea that you need to build a partnership and a relationship with your team members. It, it is difficult to be in security, but it's also difficult because we create this notion of, we know, you don't know, I know, you don't know. So eliminate that, work with people, ask them questions, right? Most important thing about this slide is that when in doubt, it's not only okay to ask, you should, and really adhere to that idea. It's always okay to ask, and you should do that. Now, we have a set of tool sets. You do vulnerable management, there will be a bunch of tools. So let's talk about one that is extremely crucial, which is your trusted spreadsheet. It might sound like it's like outdated or not, but really, you do a lot of stuff on the spreadsheet. Use it, maximize it. If you're good at Excel or any other spreadsheet, you can do a lot of really crazy stuff in there, do diff or whatever, but you know, use it and rely to it. At some point, you wanna move away from that, and you wanna automate and do other things, but for now, Hey, it's in there for you. Um, when you do well management, you obviously get into the scanning and you know tools that do that. So you have to understand how you're gonna do a strategy. So first one, if you're gonna do any tool like Nextpost, Tenovo, or any of those, then what you wanna do is you wanna have a discovery strategy. You wanna first discover things on the network because um, you know things are fragile. Um, so be careful with your scans, right? Start it small, and then use a small simple port list, you can use the default list, and then start expanding, add more ports and start growing. You're gonna figure out the things that break, that don't break, it will be much better. Do not start your vulnerability management uh, program running a tool and then doing discovery scans with you know uh, vulnerability scans. You're gonna break things, and it's not gonna be looking good, you're gonna have to deal with the, the, the fallout, so why? Start small, take it easy, you know, stages, iterations. Um, this is a bit of a joke, but you know, sometimes you use an Nmap, and sometimes you kind of have to scan a lot of stuff, and hopefully you pray that you know it will work and nothing breaks. So um, cheers to that. That was in the Spanish, so I had to modify it a little bit. Um, so you know, more about you know uh, scanning. So you have to make a decision that sometimes do I, can I do authenticated scans? So anyways, do anyone know the difference between authenticated and not authenticated scans? Yeah. So authenticated scans are those that require credentials. So you can you know, you know, log on as a user and then test vulnerabilities that way. Sometimes you can't. So you have to make a decision. You know, There's value on doing both, but you have to evaluate that. Um, another very, very important thing is that if you build an infrastructure for scanning or vulnerability management, secure it. Because it's very likely that that environment is gonna have access to a lot of different things in your environment. but that becomes a very critical system that actors can use, or even pen testers, or maybe you have a red team. So make sure that that environment is secure because it can be misused. So very important to do that as well. Um, then finally, there's a lot of considerations on your tooling, right? Technology is changing all the time, and so you need to find and evaluate tools that work for you. There's a lot of them out there, so make sure that you test them, figure out if they work for you. Um, before you introduce new tools, make sure that you meet the basic requirements. So don't don't go and get the you know the latest tool because if you don't have the basic requirements, you're just wasting time. So work on the basics, right? Your CMDB, your software stack, and then 
you know, then find new tools that will help you improve that. Um, this is also a very important thing. There is no one tool fits all. So you, you know, the idea that you buy this one tool and that's going to be everything, like you doesn't exist. You need to complement tools to help you get there. So there is no one tool that will do everything and manage your program for you. It's a combination of tools that allow you to have a better program. So if you just buy the latest scanning tool, you should rethink about that and then figure out how you complement that with other tools, especially when there are plenty of open source tools, like the one we're going to share with you today. Um, and also, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if you don't have the money or you don't have the resources, or even if you do, there's a lot of tools out there. So you know, it's cool that you want to code and you want to do a lot of tools, but why? They're already out there, and they're actually very nice and ready to go. Um, so this is the last portion of that. There's, we talk about internal intelligence. And so when we talk about internal, in, internal intelligence, we refer to like, how do I collect a lot of data to help me with my vulnerability management? Like maybe my inventory isn't good, but there's other devices out there that can help me. Well, maybe you're using, I don't know, OS Query, or maybe Windows um, Service Updates, uh, well, US, US, I forgot what it stands for. But so, well, there you go, Windows Service Update Services. So if you're using them, they have data that you can use for your vulnerability management. Just mine that data, and then you um, um, improve your visibility on your assets. So, you know, again, tools that are out there, tools that you probably use on your network, maximize them. And with that, we're going to introduce you to Manowar. Uh, we're going to then do a demo. Chris is going to work on that, explain about what it is, uh, how we use it, and hopefully we'll do a really quick live demo. Pray it, it works. So let's go. So uh, Manowar is a tool we built to, uh, to profile our servers, to kind of do the internal intelligence side, and then also to do the integrations with the external, uh, external intelligence. So the, the number one thing we wanted to do was we wanted to pull down Ubuntu security notices compare them against our environment to see which, uh, which, which hosts were, were vulnerable and which ones weren't. Um, we, we open sourced a tool, uh, we called it internally Jellyfish, but there's another Python Jellyfish project, so we renamed it Manowar, which is like a, it's like a Jellyfish, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like if you were looking at the, the theory graph that we had earlier and you were asking like where does this tie in, um, it'd be a little, little box that kind of covers both like the external intelligence and the uh, uh, internal and external intelligence stuff. Like, it kind of combines those two things into to audit results and then uh, provides a UI and an API to let you add um, both the, the parsed ex external intelligence and the, the, the profiles that we record. And then you can use it to do your triaging and, and start your remediations and all that jazz. Um, so that, that's kind of like where, it, where it's supposed to fit in. Um, so we're going to take you through an example of triaging. We're going we're gonna to start with the upstream vuln coming in. Um, we're going to show you how it profiles, we're going to run an audit, and we're going to take a look at uh, USN 3765-1, which is a curl vulnerability that came out earlier this week. Uh, then we're going to show, so, show you how you can do some unstructured uh, data investigation using our asset profiles, and uh, then th that'll be the end of the demo. Um, so I'm going to exit out of here. I had a video in case I broke everything, but um, I don't think I did, so we'll see how it works out. Uh, famous last words. All right. So... And if, uh, if you are actually do take a look at the code, there, there are a bunch of a, uh, what do you call it? There are a bunch of references to the old name Jellyfish that I still haven't cleaned up yet. So, you know, if, if you're looking and you see something called Jellyfish, it's probably just because I haven't changed it yet because I'm a little bit lazy as a human being. It's a personal, personal flaw, I guess. All right. Say what? I mean, I could. Um, I could. Yes. So uh, yeah, starting up the starting up the UI here, the and, and API all combined into one makes a nice little GUI thing available for you. Um, these are the this is the oh, sorry, typing and talking. So th this is the vuln that we're gonna we're gonna search on here, um, and then you can see that uh, Ubuntu puts out uh, new new security notices pretty regularly. So um, you know we we're actually looking at the RSS feed for this and we're parsing it, and that's how we're building down the other stuff. There is a tool that does that that I haven't got open sourced yet. It's, uh, we call it Bass internally, um, but uh, essentially it builds uh, little files that get uh, get parsed. Um, we get parsed into each individual audit. Um, and it, it, I'll show you how it looks in the UI because it, it, it's machine made here, and so it looks pretty bad. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it essentially makes these little audits that we can then and take a look at. Um, 
So I'm going to start by uh, showing you. So I have I have a bunch of LXC containers uh, on my host. Uh, I got I got four of them, and then I I, I used Etsy host to kind of simulate a production environment where there'd be like DNS entries. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and use a, what I call schedule schedule two. Um, it's a the second version of a, a big SSH type thing that I wrote in Python. Um, So what it's going to do is it's going to reach out to, to all the hosts in my thing. It does it multi-threaded, so you could do it a little faster. There's also uh, an agent that will push data back to the API, but it doesn't. It's it's not it's not polished. So if you want to use it, you should definitely make a pull request, and I will probably accept it. Um, but uh, it uh, it does go multi-threaded, uh, so that it, it does work pretty fast. To that py, yeah. So you can see it. Uh, you know, it has a bunch of threads open. Uh, effectively, it's just, just what I want to show by going there. Um, I put the verbose mode on, and it has some interesting logging because it was before I really got into using Logger as a module, and now I'm kind of kicking myself about it. It's, it's one of the first pro projects that I worked on in Python, so if you look at uh, especially the early modules, there's a lot of bad code there, so pull requests will be helpful. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it's it's going to run through here, and this takes a little bit, and there are, there are some like wait and see stuff, but uh, essentially it's going out to each host. And it, it's it's SSHing on, running a series of commands, pulling the data back, parsing it, and then storing it in our database. Um, and this is the awkward part. Yeah, and SSH is onto the hosts and, and, and profiles it profiles the host by running a bunch of SSH or run it, running a bunch of bash commands. Um, those bash commands re, uh, send the data back in like a uh, formatted manner, and then I then I uh, import it into my database. Um, yeah, yeah, it's effectively an authenticated scan. Um, yeah, so, so the key here is that uh, because of the environment in which we are, you know, running some other tools that we have no access to the code is difficult. So this is a new way to do it. And so, to be honest, if you don't want to spend time, you know, money on some of the expensive, you know, tools, this is a fairly nice way to do and get the same advantage <laughs> as the paid tools. So. Uh, you get, there's a there's an output at the end and show you like what what failed what didn't fail and then uh, you know some other things. Um, I'm going to show you how it looks uh, in in the actual host. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go to let's go to host search and we'll. I only have five hosts defined, so we'll we'll take a test box two here, which is the first LXC container. Um, and you can see that I, I've pulled back a bunch of results here. So um, I have some graphs that get made automatically. Um, sometimes they make sense, sometimes they don't. In this case, they do. So this is showing you like the, the collection types I pull back. I have the concept of type, subtype, and value. Um, so each type is a thing. So like here's packages, here's LS mods, here's users, um, things like that. And, and you can add custom collections in there. Um, and then to keep things uh, kind of space efficient on the back end, I record the first time I saw it and the last time I saw it um, in the database. And I just keep updating that record every time I see it again. Um, that way I don't have to like store a new entry every time. And it cuts down on the storage space pretty significantly and kind of keeps like the amount of storage you need per host relatively static, um, depending on like how long you keep things after they've gone kind of out of date. Um, but you can use this to like look at like what what's going on or like what. Uh, so like if you wanted to find like the bash version, it should have worked. Ah, it's because I spelled bash wrong, and I put it in the wrong thing. But yes, yeah, so like uh, you can see that there's a the bash package and the version that it's at. And uh, you know you could do this with like users too. So like if you wanted to grab the users back and you want to find all the users that you had the bash shell, like you could find ah now there's there's three on this box that have the bash shell. And so the, yeah, it, it's part of it's kind of like how the collections look. So now we're going to run the the audits on themselves. Um, so uh, you can you can write custom audits. Uh, you don't have to use like the the, the bash tool to write audits. Um, but you, you essentially get to, to decide to, to bucket things in the hosts and then do particular comparisons against those hosts. The primary use case there is like different versions of Ubuntu or different versions of Red Hat will have different like major version packages installed. And so you want to like when they put the backports on, you want to check against that backported version, not necessarily against like the, the upstream version or uh, standardized version across the thing. Um, 
sorry. Um, So right now it's going through all these hosts and it's it's uh, it's it's checking them or right, all these audits and checking them against all the hosts. Um, uh, this is also multi-threaded, um, so that's fun times there. Um, a lot of you know um, things. Uh, it does it, it does it, it's going to do its thing. And then I'm going to run what it's called a collate. I, sp I broke those out because in our environment there were enough hosts where trying to collate while you're collect while you're analyzing didn't work well. Um, but really it's just it's just summing up all the values and sticking it in. So that'll that'll happen shortly afterwards. Um, but when you look at it, you can see that it's, it's doing inserts and updates. It's kind of using that same storage model where, where if I see an audit pass or fail and I, and I see it again, instead of storing each individual audit pass or failure, I can just, you know, update and say, I saw, I saw it start to fail here and start end to fail here. So you kind of get this idea of, like, how long it was without having to store different values across for, for everything. Um, uh, collate. All right, so the collate ran. So let's uh, let's show you some audits um, here. Um, so there there is a dashboard that hasn't been open source yet. It was made by our UI team, who's like they're wizards, but uh, it's in a different repo, and so we didn't have time to go get it open source. And it looks much better than this page. Um, but uh, you know, this page is what I have at the moment, uh, seven six five, I believe. Yeah. So this is the curl bone. Um, Open it up, and you can see like historically what, what's what's gone down. Um, and tomorrow it'll it'll have a different graph. Um, so, and this is actually something I could show too. Like last night, uh, the automated upgrade ran on on all my LXC containers, and actually upgraded all my curl versions um, because I have uh, automatic security no, uh, things turned on for these LXC containers. Because, you know, why not? Um, and so now they all pass, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can see that I I've bucketed uh, things. Uh, it, based on their, their version, this is what you get by default. I guess I should zoom into that, make it a little easier to read. Uh, yeah, so I bucketed things based on like what, what version they're on. Um, there's a collection in there that tells you like uh, the, it uses LSB release dash A to figure out like what, what Ubuntu version you're in. And then I, I, I've checked against the thing and I, and I check each of these to see if the version is greater than this for the, this particular package or this collection type and subtype uh, combination, um, which, is, which matches what you see uh, here in the, in the actual audit itself, like each one of these, it's so like, it, essentially it's just parsing and making an audit that makes sense for that. Um, all right, I think the next thing I was gonna show is like how to do some of the investigation side. Um, so like, you don't always want to work off an audit. Sometimes you want to just, you know, you get a question like, hey, what's blah? Um, for that we have uh, two, diff two main types of searches, collect, uh, like uh, collected values and collected subtypes. Then we also had like uh, by pop and by serve type. Pop you can think of like a data center, um, and then like serve type you can think of like so like uh, I have a workstation serve type that I added here, which is just this workstation. I literally SSH into my own workstation and add, add it to the collection. Um, but you could look at like how many audits it's passing and failing, um, or like how many hosts are in that that particular that particular serve type, and you could sort them down and you you know you could cl click in and click in, click out and things like that. Um, so like let's say you wanted to find. Um, Let's see, what was the example that I put in here? I will go packages bash again, right? Because everything's got a bash package right now. Um, so this would pull back like the versions of bash that are seen in the environment, um, and then like what hosts they're on. So you could look at, you know, like here's, here's the pops or data centers, or uh, here's, here's the serve types that are there, or like here's the values. This one makes a lot more sense when you have, you know, a differing set of values, but you know, um, you get the idea. Um, same thing with like, uh, um, the, the subtypes, um, one of those, the, the general one we show is like uh, users. So like you could look for, uh, shoot, is it user or users? We'll find out. Uh, but you could look at uh, like users and, uh, oop, users, fun times. But yeah, you could pull back and so you can look at your environment and you can say, all right, so I've got, across my environment, I've got uh, the apt user on everything, all five hosts. But uh, on one host, it's been false. One host, it's been, it's been no login. Um, 
that's mainly because my workstation was an upgrade, so it used to be minfall, so now it's just been no login. But uh, yeah, you can, so you could, you could pull back and, and, and you could take a look at like all the things there. So like you could look at um, all the users that have you know, Bash as their, their shell, and you can see that you know, me and, and my root user are on everything, and then this Ubuntu user is just on my four LXC containers. Like, so you, you, could, you could start to pull back data about your environment. And because you can add your own custom collections in here, it's not just limited to what you can do security-wise. You could also do investigations about like, your own custom versions of packages or settings that you've set uh, and things like that. And that's, that's kind of the, the full demo there. Um, so you, t you take, you take the, the USN, the curl, and then you'd, you'd, you'd look at it and you'd say, all right, and you'd start to, start to do your triaging, right? You'd say, do we use curl on our thing? Look, it's affected here. What, what's the impact of patching? Uh, and you could, you could really take it and start to use this intelligence instead of having to say, well, how bad does this affect us, sort of thing. Um, there are, I should, I should point out some caveats, there are a bunch of slightly broken things um, because we, we kind of took it out of the environment and stuck it into an open source one, so there's like a bunch of helper scripts that aren't there anymore um, that, I, that I'd need to fix. And it was designed with Ubuntu only in mind, now, not only, but like we, we took shortcuts to make it work with Ubuntu, so if you wanted to use it on Red Hat, you'd have to do some things, or if you wanted to use it on a Windows, you'd have to do things. Um, and then, yeah, the dashboard hasn't been open sourced yet, and there's lots of references to Jellyfish that I should go grab and fix. Um, and I, I think that's the demo. So we'll go back to remediation. All right, so um, again, I'm just gonna recap on what happened here. So, so uh, this is a tool that was being built. Chris is the mastermind of the tool. And the main goal is, um, this tool does the equivalent to authenticated scans. We're SSH in two things, and we're mining the data on all the systems. We're actually are able to do a lot better than authenticated scans, because we can do this on demand, or we can do it on the fly, we save the data. So we are able to do a really fast triage. If the vulnerability comes in, so the other thing that is not very clear on this example is that since we're grabbing the USNs as they come in, it's automated, literally, a USN comes in, we're like, just okay, is there a new USN? Oh, okay, it's a new vulnerability, are we impacted? Maybe, maybe not. So it's now automated to the point that we can concentrate on other important things like remediation and mitigation. So when you work on mitigation and remediation, which are two different things, you need to interact with organization. And so um, sometimes you need to cut tickets and you need to basically tell them to go and fix that. So be mindful of the tickets that you create to organizations. Um, make sure that you test you know, if you're gonna provide some sort of remediation instructions that they actually do work. Um, do not shame people. Th that is a very bad thing about our culture and security. We're not there to shame, we're there to provide a service. Our service is to secure the, the assets in the company or the company or organization you work for. Shaming someone for not doing something, it might work, but it doesn't pay off in the long run. So avoid that, use the shaming when you really need it. It's a nice tool, but you have to be careful and be you know, not knowledgeable to when to use that. The data that you have has to be accurate. It's very important. So one of the values of Jellyfish is that since we're able to collect and aggregate the data, our value of that intelligence, that internal intelligence that we call, is super high. So because of the value of the data, we're able to make very fast decisions. Um, Another thing that it was in here is the idea of self-service. At some point, you want to kind of let teams do their own thing and be like, hey, here's this tool. Go and find out there's vulnerabilities. You know, if you want to remediate, then you can go on self-service. And as you pass, you will find out if you're passing the audit, yes or no. And so that way, they're keeping track and they're making sure they're doing, you know, they're progressing on the remediation. Um, you know, there's another important thing that, that is a concept of remediation and mitigation. You know, what are your patching capabilities? Can I patch? Um, you know, how fast can I deploy a patch? Um, how accurate is that patch? Is that going to work or is that going to break certain things? Um, the other thing is you might not be able to patch. So, like, maybe you can mitigate something. So this is why knowing your network is very important. Maybe you can put some ACLs in place. Maybe you decide to um, limit the users that have access to something. So remediation, mitigation, two different things, but they work fairly well together. Sometimes you need to mitigate something, stop that bleed, and then you work into how you're going to remediate it. You need to think about the idea and figure out the best way to address that. It's very important in bull management that you document your decisions because things could go bad and you want to make sure that you document them there, right? You need to let your organization know, hey, we're going to make the decision. You're okay with that? 
Yes? All right, cool. It's now documented. So if something goes wrong, you can then say, hey, we asked for advice and we wanted to make sure that you were aware of these things because things could go wrong. Document your decisions. Make sure that people know that you're doing those things. Again, the, re the relationship between you and the organization is super important. Pitfalls. It's going to happen. So what are you going to do when <laughs> the day where things go really, really bad? Well, our advice is that's going to happen, and one day things are going to go to hell. Um, first, do not panic. Just chill, pause for a moment. Don't blame and shame again. It's no one's fault. Things just happen, right? Um, and then the most important thing when things go south is that you need to conduct lessons learned. Figure out what, why things went wrong, how, what can you do different. If you take these approaches, you're going to be able to, one, improve your, yourself. You're going to build a better relationship with your peers. And three, you're going to improve your program. So again, this is advice that we, that we experience, and we can tell you this. So take this with a, of gra um, with a grain of salt, but use this advice. It's going to be valuable to you. Um, so now. We kind of talk about the vulnerability management program. That's kind of like a standard program, something that most programs should aim and do. And again, we're going to repeat the two goals. So understand vulnerabilities, triage them fast, and then work on remediation and mitigation. But we now know that there are other things out there. People are using the cloud. People are using new languages and so forth. So we have next level ideas. So you got your, your um, vulnerability management program mature. All right, let's, let's get to improve that. So why don't you? basically start making games out of that. Why don't you create a scoreboard where you track who is patching faster or who is the one that is able to work with you better and maybe give him some swag. Who doesn't love swag? Well, we got some swag in here that we'll share with you for those that ask questions. So, you know, that good example of why you want to do stuff like that. Um, another thing is work towards automation. So the, the stuff that we show in here, the, all the work that Chris did um, has been possible because there's a lot of orchestration automation. So if you can actually move to, towards that level, you're going to be golden. So make sure that your program moves towards that direction. It's better that you kind of let a scan run, come back, and those, you know, the self-assessment for you and just click a few buttons, very useful. So, um, but again, make sure that if you're using orchestration, you want to secure your pipeline because you know people use Jenkins, and Jenkins is very easy to exploit, and people like to exploit that. So make sure that you take care of that as well. Um, finally, a very good thing to have in an organization is bug bounty. You want to get into the bug bounty program. Um, be ready. If you're not mature, if you don't have some of the basics, do, do not even attempt to do that. It, it will be a waste of your time. It will be a waste of your effort. You're going to get plenty of data, be ready to be able to respond to those reports, be mindful of the people that are doing that, partner with any of the known um, bug bounty you know, uh, entities that are doing that. So it's a recommendation, a very valuable one. Um, we had this slide in here, which is how not to measure your program success. The success of your program is going to be measured by you and is different per organization. You are going to define that goal. The way that we defined how we measure our maturity on our program was early on with the three goals that we defined. And as you are able to see, we're able to be very mature in that regard. We're able to get vulnerabilities extremely fast. We're able to triage fairly fast. And we're able to provide the service on how to remediate, medi remediate and mitigate things. So we feel very confident that our program has reached a really nice maturity level. Your program might be different. You need to understand your goals, and then your goals will define how you're measuring your program. Finally, we're going to have some takeaways. I'm going to let Chris also give his input in that. So the most important thing for me in here is that there is this concept of ODA loop, which is you know you repeat something. So iterations on your program are very important. Do something, figure out what did, why it didn't work, improve it, get better, and just keep repeating. And then Chris? bugged out like it, it it it's surprising how, how how much better like you get at vuln management when you just start to iterate and you say ah oh, we didn't we didn't handle that vuln necessarily the best but we're not going to like go and, and super focus on it and like have 16 continuous sprints of like we're going to fix this vuln instead of going and saying all right well let, let, let's just go to the next one because that one's just as bad um you, you do want to you do I, I said it before but you got to stick and move you got to get a little muhammad ali in there um 
And then always, always make sure to validate your data. Like if, if you're working with junk data, you're going to get junk results and you're going to get, you know, garbage in, garbage out, essentially. So, so make sure that the data that you're making decisions on actually makes sense and it's actually useful for your environment. Uh, yeah. yeah, and with that, we get to conclusions. Uh, we, have a, we have a different deck than this one. There's a bunch of tools that originally we wanted to share with you. There's a lot of open source and they're broken down. This time, um, you want to take a picture of that. So what we have is now this Google Sheet that covers a bunch of open source tools that you can use. We're going to have the link to the talk in there as well. Um, you know, and so you have an opportunity to test a bunch of the tools out there. We tested many of them. We know that they work. We suggested them for you. So it's your turn to investigate them and use them. Again, they're free, and the tool we just provided you to you is free. So with that, um, any questions? So how easily could your, your system be ported over to any Debian system, or would it work out of box? Um, oh, uh, so the question was, uh, how easy could your system be ported over to a Debian system? Um, Probably, probably fairly simply. Um, the biggest kind of Ubuntu-specific requirement we use we use the the apt package, uh, like Python module, and I think Ubuntu distributes that. But I mean, we should be able to, to drop and replace some other. We use it for for process or for uh, parsing the version data, and there, there's there's stuff in the standard library that I could have used if I were more intelligent. So like, install on a Debian system from the Ubuntu repository. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So like it, you could, you could definitely get it going fairly simply. Well, not simply, but like with a small amount of elbow grease. So. Are you a medium or large? <laughs> we got swag. I, I told you we're gonna. Have so we're gonna order that swag. Yeah. yeah. We, we have just minutes left. So uh, questions? Oh. Oh, I have a really stupid question. I love those. Have you written up Moz in my lab? So in my, in my little research lab, I have 54 cores, you know, a bunch of Xenon, and I'm putting up Moz. And I'm, how, do you, how would you integrate this? Because one of the things that I run into is when I'm continuing doing Ubuntu uh, 18.04 install, there's this little process. Do you, do you handle how you do the installations with the tools? Uh, do we, <coughs> so, uh, the installation we, we have like salt that we use at our, at our company for like handling like config management type stuff. It's like uh, it's like Ansible or, or Puppet, and that's how we handle kind of the config side for each server, like making sure that the like the SSH key is on each server and making sure that like e even the like the what we call the jellyfish servers by themselves, the, making sure that all the right jobs are in the right place and all the right code landed in the right places. Um, but I haven't open source like we have an open source like our what we call bundler like our packaging system. So um, it, it would be a lot of manual work at the moment. Right now, I use a script that just runs the page. Oh. Storage, right? oh. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I replicate that. that I don't know. Kind of painful if I'm trying to research something. I, I definitely, I definitely see how that that works. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. So what are some awesome things you're doing, like, or ideas of what a uh, company can do to make a better self-remediation for the rest of the board, right? Because obviously security might have recommendations on how to do it, but there's a lot more not security people to actually get the things done. Um, oh, uh, so the, I guess the question is, what, what sort of things should you be doing next? Or? Oh, yeah. So what, what sort of things should you be providing to your organization to help them self-remediate? Um, essentially, uh, the, the data that you're looking at is something that you should provide to your org. And you, <coughs> excuse me, you might, you might want to like limit who has access to it because it, you know, it kind of tells you how you can attack your environment. But uh, it, for, the, for the people responsible for administering your boxes, handing them data that says, hey, you're vulnerable to X is very powerful to them and and like they, they can go and they can they can fix that themselves if, if they just know that they're vulnerable to something and it helps them make make the case to their management that they should really be handling X like higher up on their to-do list right maybe maybe this gets in in front of some other you know improvement or, or feature request because they know that hey it's security had they see us there like let's go fix it before they get mad at us um, yeah, I, I will add to that. That I will add to to that question that um, 
we talk about garbage in, garbage out, your quality of the data that you provide to someone is really important, right? So if you go to the, to the nitty gritty of, hey, this is the package you need to fix, this is the one that is bad, this is the one that you need to replace it with, and here is how you do it, sometimes it's just, it's just super easy. You wanna get like three bullet points on how to solve the problem. If you are able to do that, then you're basically probably where everyone to do it. And over time, people will realize that they can just make it even simpler. You tell them what to do and they, they just follow. But if you send them a report, like many people have done, so, so there's even pen testers do this. They have a report out of their tool and it's not really meaningful, right? If you just give them a report scan that says, here, these are all the vulnerabilities, like who's gonna read that? You have to make it so it's like bullet points. This is vulnerability one, this is how you fix it. Vulnerability two, this is how you fix it. That's how you actually do things and you expedite things. Any other question? Oh, <laughs> I saw you, you, uh, you scanned the four or five local containers fairly trivially, but what, what happens when you scale the number of hosts up? What happens to performance or turnaround times for the audit? Uh, yeah, uh, almost the time left, but uh, it does, it, you're gonna wanna... We reached a point actually at about 30, 30,000-ish hosts, 20, 30,000 hosts, where we started running into problems with, with performance on, on a, a fairly beefy single box. Um, at that point, you're gonna wanna look at like splitting out your collections across multiple hosts. Um, we did have some ideas about how we'd rewrite the Manowar uh, to be like more cloud native, so they use like RDS and uh, API gateway and stuff like that, but we, ha we haven't built that type of stuff yet. But yeah, there's definitely a limit at which like you have to start you know, splitting your, your work up into multiple hosts, and there's not necessarily a lot of tooling to help you do it. Um, so w once you reach that point, like, pull requests, and I will accept them. I have never turned down a pull request, so. I think we're running out of time. So okay. we're running out of time, thank you for being here. One final note is that you can actually carve a lot of queries, so you can use this for instant response, Blue Teams. So if you got any questions, we'll be out there. Thank you for being here, it's seven in the morning, enjoy Shellcon.